Paul is, is, he's such a good writer. You know, Romans isn't a short book, you know, a short letter, you know, it's just a letter, guys. Uh, it's not a short letter, but he's written it in such a way that it's, it holds their attention. It's almost like a mini novel. Uh, so if you're looking at, at the big perspective, the big 30,000 foot, remember um, Romans has written the, in the, about the wrath of God in, in chapters 1 to 4, uh, which really points to why is God mad? Well, it's because God is so righteous. Uh, and if he's so righteous, then he can't put up with any sin whatsoever. But he has a, an answer to that. Um, the second section is going to be chapters 5 to 8, uh, where he talks about the grace of God. And so it's kind of this answer to this righteousness thing and this anger and this wrath. Um, and then the sec third section is the plan of God. How do we get this grace? What's, what's going on? How, what, how do we operate? And then finally, the will of God. What do we do from here? Okay, so, so it's, this, it's really this, this many little uh, uh, novel. It's a story. And so early on, we get some, some arguments and some stuff that he's throwing down that he's hearing um, about the church in Rome and that he's, he's trying to address. And so as people are reading this, they're going, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, we're like that. Okay, I got that. And so we can often look at this and go, yeah, yeah, okay, we're like that too, you know. Um, Vodi Bachman, one of my favorite commentators uh, right now, uh, brings out that uh, uh, all other religions in, in the world, other than Christianity, uh, all other religions have three major points. You have a religious experience. Uh, you do more than you do good, and then at the end, you hope for the best. That's every other religion. You have a religious experience, you do more than good, and you hope for the best. And I'll tell a real quick story, and then we'll start with Scripture. Um, we were in India uh, in um, 2012, I think, and we just happened to be visiting a... Um, uh, a leper colony, uh, you know, leprosy is, is, they've got cures for it now, not that big a deal. But uh, we were visiting a leper col colony and um, just talking with some people and talking about the Lord and that type of thing. And um, we were visiting and, and this other fellow came in and he was, he was a do-gooder, but he was, he was a uh, uh, Hindu. And he came in and he knew some English, pretty good actually. And he was uh, doing some sacrifice to uh, the little God thing they had down there and ringing a bell. And, and so we got to talking to him and, and asking. He was bringing food to the people and whatnot and just start, started talking about, well, what, what is, tell us about your religion, you know. And so he started telling us about how it operated and that type of thing and, and uh, said that, that he was there and he was doing good and he was hoping that, you know, uh, things were going to go, go, go well. And it was just like what? Uh, what Vody Bachman said, he had a religious experience, he was doing more good than, than bad, and he was going to hope for the best. And I did say, I said, it was one of, those, one of those times, one of those rare times where you actually know what to say. And usually I figure out what to say about three hours too late, but this time I actually knew what to say. And I said, well, how do you know you're going to go to heaven? And it stopped him dead in his tracks. It, he did not know the, how to answer that. I said, how do you know when you've done good enough? When, when's good enough? And he had no clue for that. And he, it really, really got him. And so we, you know, we, we tried to tell him about, the, uh, about Christ, about the gospel and that type of thing. And, and if you have Christ in your heart, he's already paid the debt. You are good enough. And, and I'm hoping that he eventually came to the Lord. Uh, but, uh, uh, but all religions are, are that way. So anyway, Paul addresses it now in uh, Revelation. I mean, Revelation. <laughs> we came out of Revelation, guys. That's why I'm in the Revelation. Uh, Paul addresses it pretty clearly in, in Romans 3. And 3.23 is one of the most famous scriptures coming out of it. But we'll start with verse 1. 
Um, Solomon, would you read um, verses 1 and 2? Sure. Romans, yep. Romans 3, verse 1 and 2. All right. Every time I read, I've got to pick up the phone. That's fine. Um, <laughs> what advantage, then, is there in being a Jew? Or what value is there in circumcision? Much in every way, first of all, the Jews have been entrusted with the very words of God. All right. Again, now who's he talking to? He's talking to the Jews of the church of Greeks and Jews, Roman Greeks and Jews, in the Roman church in Rome. And so, and because the Jews in particular are having this little snoop fit of, of holier-than-thou situation um, and, and thumbing their nose at, uh, at the Greeks that were in the church, the Gentiles, the Greeks. Um, and so one of the arguments is circumcision. One of the arguments is um, uh, what is it about, it, it, about the law? Who, has the, who, who had the law? It was the Jew, right? The Jews kept the law, had the law, protected the law. Um, now, they didn't recognize the message. They protected. It's like they had this code, this perfect code, but they didn't understand its full meaning. And, and the Lord, I'm sure, blinded them for a good purpose so that we could be grafted in. Um, well, and Rich, this kind of reminds me, you know, it's, it's one, of the air, one of the chapters where you, the chapter break uh, really doesn't flow. Because if you, if you consider those first two verses it, with the end of chapter two, mm. it makes much more sense. Uh, it's not. <laughs> um, Go for it. But like, if you, if you, you know, we we finished last week talking about the the inward and outward circumcision, you know, yeah. the the need for consecration, a physical mark, um, versus an inward transformation that's provided by the gospel. Uh, those first two verses kind of answer the question, like, okay, well, what's more important, compliance with the law or mm -hmm. compliance with the gospel and, and recognition of the gospel? For a life and submission to the gospel, right? And so, you know, circumcision, like you said, circumcision. God was interested in the in the spiritual circumcision more than he was the physical circumcision. But it's mm -hmm. interesting that he established the physical circumcision in order so so that we could understand later on the spiritual circumcision. So would that would that allegory mean like like just sacrificing something for God? It does, in a sense, it's a it's a sacrifice. Yeah, in a sense. or being being consecrated, being con set apart. What, is, what does that word mean? Consecrated, set apart. Okay. Specialized. So, right, identified with mm -hmm. God. Yep. That you know, one of the markings of being a Jew was being physically circum circumcised. So we don't have tattoos or necklaces or a specific haircut so how do we mark ourselves as you know being followers of god it's it's an inward transformation yep notice it says that uh what advantage then is there to being a jew uh or what value is circumcision much in every way it's like there's a bunch of ways it mentions um but then he only miss, mentions really one right here. First of all, the Jews have been entrusted with the very words of God, which, I mean, they were chosen for a, for a reason. So maybe their culture, their personality, or who knows why God chose the Jews. But they did preserve the law. They, they, they preserved God's word, uh, which was very important. Very So good. In the ESV, instead of the, the words of God, it says oracles of God. So I kind of go to yeah. the, uh, is that more along the lines of like rituals or like the precepts? Everything, or, I, yeah, everything I read was like written word, oracles, the written word kind of thing. Um, I'm sure at one point, well, if you think about it, though, there was a time before it was written because Moses Moses wrote a bunch of it, so there was a time before it was written. So in that came, in that sense, it was oral prior to him writing it. 
uh, written or otherwise, they preserved it. Mm-hmm. How's that? Absolutely. I'll go with that. Uh, Daniel, you're right there next to Sa- uh, to uh, Solomon. You, you still there? They're on mute. They're on mute? Oh, okay. All right. I see. It looks like Solomon's outside. Yeah. I think he's shoveling snow. All right. You're doing something in the back of the truck. <laughs> yeah. oh, I see a ladder. Okay. Doug. Doug. Yes, sir. Sir, would you read uh, three and four? Three and four. Okay. What if someone were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. Let God be true, though. Everyone were a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. This one threw me a little bit, just the way it's, it's written. But when they explained it, it's like, oh, that makes sense. Our faithfulness has no effect whatsoever on God's faithfulness. No. And that's it's hard for us to kind of swallow. Hard for me to swallow, I think. Because that's not really how we're bit, how we're bent. If somebody messes with me too much, I'm kinda I'm kinda like, okay, fine. <laughs> I'm done, you know. But God is so faithful and so pure that see that's that's what I drew out of it mm-hmm. was God is unfaithful or uh, God is faithful no matter what yep. and and his faithfulness actually proves how how weak our faithfulness is yep yep right on target right on target um is uh, is Daniel there Solomon uh, Daniel's inside. He is. He's inside. Okay, no problem. Yeah, he's he's helping the guys out with something. We're trying to get this air conditioner set up. Gotcha. Air conditioning is important. You bet. There's no there's no AC down. There's no electricity down here because of the hurricane damage. Oh. Oh, you're down in Louisiana t- area. Yeah, I drove down today. Oh, you're working. Oh, okay. For down there. You, are you working for you're working for somebody in that area doing I'm sorry, what did you say? Are you working for somebody doing hurricane relief? Um I just I, I drove down here because it's kind of a long story. The guy the guy that I was working for before, uh there was whenever the hurricane came through, it was it was throwing rain our way in Columbia and we were supposed to be doing a roofing job because he's got a roofing company. But we couldn't start because you can't just rip off a roof while it could rain because it just flood out their entire house and ruin everything. Yeah. So we didn't have uh, work for two weeks. And he was like, we might start next week. But I, I didn't want to take a chance. So I just drove down here and I, and I was started looking for work and he happened to be down here. Oh, okay. A little step of faith there. I like it. So we're, just, we're just roughing it right now, trying to find some work. All right. Cool. All right. Um, Ned, would you read five through eight, please, sir? You bet. But if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? I speak in a human way. By no means, for then how could God judge the world? But if through my life, but if through my life God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? And why not do evil, but good may come? As some people slanderously charge us with saying, their condemnation is just. All right. Uh, You know, I've actually heard, um, I was talking with a Muslim one time. I heard his argument. He said, God made me sinful, so he must accept me this way. And uh, not not in a in the desire to change whatsoever, but God made me this way, so deal with it. That, that was his his take, you know. Um, and then you know Paul was improperly quoted, evidently, in the Church of Rome. Um, that well, since since God's grace overwhelms sin, we should sin more in order to get more grace. 
And so obviously that's not good theology. And <laughs> uh, not kind of a messed up way of looking at it. That's a messed up way of looking at it. But you know what? Man will figure it out one way or the other, right? Figure out how to sin best. Um, ways to justify it. Ways to justify it. That's right. Good word. Good word. Um, I'm going to read uh, verse 9 here. What shall we conclude then? Do we have any advantage? Not at all. Uh, he's talking about us, uh, about the Jews. Not at all. For we have already made the charge. The Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. Um, so concerning sin, concerning righteousness, there is no advantage whatsoever, one or the other. Um, comments? Again, this is all pretty basic, but it's, it's good stuff. Uh, we lost Solomon. In the woods, in the outwoods somewhere, <laughs> out back. Doug, long section. Would you read 10 through 18? Okay. Um, okay. As it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In the past are ruin and misery. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And I thought, of course, he's quoting from Psalms. And I thought this was really interesting. Somebody said that uh, they're quoting, he's quoting from different Psalms. But if you look at each one of them separately, uh, they are uh, pointed to or uh, meant to be about different people, different contexts. If you, if you look at it in context, some... Some of them are strictly to the Jews. Some of them are strictly to the Gentiles. And so he's saying here and mixing this up, he's saying very specifically, you're all lost. You're I'm back. Sorry about that, guys. Yeah, no problem. No problem. I, my phone overheated and I tried, I tried texting somebody at the same time as being in the call and it just crashed everything. <laughs> no problem. No problem. Man. Glad you're here. Uh, so he's, he's saying, even in the scriptures that he's pulled out of Psalms, he is telling the, the uh, church in Rome, you're all lost. There is nobody. And, of course, he's speaking in kind of a hyperbole where it's overstated. You know, where Jesus said, uh, um, unless you love me more than you love your parents, unless you love, you know, all that. He, he, in other words, you should love me and hate your parents. Well, he doesn't mean hate your parents. He means love me so much that and appreciate me so much that the love for your parents looks like hatred. So he's kind of speaking in a little bit of hyperbole and in the, the scriptures are speaking in a little bit of hyperbole, but he's specifically saying you're all lost. None of you are special. Get over it. So, um, is, is, uh, Daniel is Daniel. Oh, I see Daniel outside. Never mind. Yeah, Daniel's helping them with the generator right now. It's heavy. No problem. Uh, can you read uh, uh, 19 and 20, Solomon? Yeah. Okay. All right. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. Hmm. You know that's that's a that's, that's a wisdom right there. Yeah, it, it, that's a real easy section to just kind of just write over, right? And just just read right over. But the start end of verse twenty is amazing because it says that 
all this law that was written that all these Jews tried to follow for so many years, it couldn't save them. Therefore, yeah. no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. So it doesn't matter how much they sacrifice, the rituals that they did, all those things that, that were lined out in the law. Because what was the law good for? What was the only target, the only thing that the law was there to do? Transform us? No. Keep us, keep us holy and pure? No. Nope. Read, read the last end of uh, verse 20. To be conscious of sin. Knowledge of sin. Conscious of our sin. So it led Me us and my friend. Huh? Me and my friend were talking about this the other day. Because yeah. we, we've got a friend who is agnostic or maybe even atheist. And we were, we were talking to, to him about how um, as soon as you realize how real the devil is, that's mm -hmm. when you understand how real God is and how good God is. Yeah. And that's like... When you start trying to better your life and trying to do good, that's when you understand how hard the temptation is to do bad. Yeah, that's right. That's right. It's pretty crazy. Right on target. But it's, it's interesting that uh, all of the Old Testament was meant just to set up the New Testament, you know, and, and the grace that, that comes from it and to bring in the Spirit and to make us appreciate that we're all sinful and that God totally provided our righteousness totally and completely. Um, this is kind of a long section um, and I'm going to read it real quick as quick as I can, but I think it's important uh, that, that expounds this a little more. It's in Hebrews. It's in 10 Hebrews 10, one to 14. And it really, it really defines this, concept even more and nobody knows who wrote Hebrews uh, and that that is a fact because nobody claims it but this has some this has some Pauline in it as as you can as 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 is said so anyway the, it says the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming not the realities themselves for this reason it can never be uh, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Did you catch that? I mean, that's, that's amazing. It's impossible for them to take away sin. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll, I have come to do your will, my God. Of course, this is Jesus talking. First, he said, sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them. Though they were offered in accordance with the law, they did it perfectly. Then he said, here I am. I have come to do your will. He set aside the first to establish the second. So he set aside the law to establish the second covenant. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties again and again. He offers the same sacrifices, which never take away sins. But when this priest has offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, this priest being Jesus, uh, he sat down at the right hand of God, and since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made a footstool, his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Of course, that would be the saints. Man, I mean, this is just, I had, I've seen it before, probably heard it before, but it really hit this week in, in going over this, that the law, no matter how perfectly they did it, all it did was to emphasize how sinful they were. 
Um, and all it did was to point to the sin, but it was not the cure. The law and the sacrifices were not the cure. They were all to point to the future to Christ. So interesting, interesting stuff. Um, if, uh, let's see, Ned, would you, sir, please read 21 through 24. Good thing. But now the righteousness of God has been, has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. There's the answer. Everybody mm -hmm. has sinned. How many times have you tried to talk to somebody and um, they're good people, wonderful people, would take the shirt off their back to give them to, but and and they don't they don't sense that they've sinned against God. Well, I've never killed anybody, right? Um, I do good things. Uh, why do I need Jesus? What what's what's this all about? Why in the world? Why are you talking to me? You know, um, and they think they're fine. They think that them and the and the man upstairs are just fine, right, Doug? Yep. <laughs> they got that agreement. Have that agreement. That's right. <laughs> and uh, and it is so common. It's so hard, so hard to witness to somebody who's just a good guy, just a good lady, whatever. So hard. Um, but if you can convince them that everybody has sinned. But then there's that thing again that, that, with the world, world religions that, well, I'm, I'm a good person. And my good's going to outweigh my bad. I hope. I'm good. Right? So common. So common. I'm afraid it's pretty common in the church, too. You know, if people don't think about it. Yeah. So. Well, uh, I go to church every Sunday. And when I was nine, I went down and got baptized. So, I mean... I did all the stuff I'm supposed to do. Yeah. I tithe, you know. <laughs> yeah. It's very fun. I mean, it, there's not a whole lot of distinction between that and just saying, I try to do good. Yeah. Yeah. So much more to it than that, though. There is. You better believe it. And, and, I, don't, and I don't mean just as much as, as what we have to put into it, but there's so much more there that God has to offer us. Mm that people don't see, you know, as being, a, a, um, you know, as giving us hope mm -hmm. and what we have to look forward to and all. Yeah. Yeah. That relationship, I think a lot of people miss out on that, that right. tight relationship with the Lord. No doubt. All right, Doug, would you read 25 and 26, please, sir? Um, let's see. Uh, hold on a second here. Let me get my eyes right. <laughs> 25 and 26. Um, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed away for, over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and, just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. What does that mean? What do you think? Hmm. So, so go ahead. Verse twenty six is that he presented, you know, to me that I read that as to say he presented the perfect sacrifice. And in doing so, Jesus was not only just but he was also the justifier yeah. of the one who has faith in him. Right. Um, 
Yeah. He's also our, our role our role model too. Absolutely. Our, yeah. our example. The second half of twenty five, I need some explanation. In his forbearance he had left the sins committed before beforehand unpunished. Well, just like you know, I had, to, I had trouble with this too. I had to, I had to kind of oh, ponder and look, look this up. Um, just like the sacrifices wouldn't satisfy the sins of the people uh, in his forbearance, in his, in other words, his his waiting to punish, waiting to do anything with that, um, his. His love for us, his forbearance, his waiting to punish, uh, was held off until after the true sacrifice was made. Um, you think that could mean that all the people that came before Jesus were forgiven? That's a good point, Solomon. And it how how is it that people are forgiven now? Right. How, well, how is it? What? How do we? And it kind of says it. It um, look at uh, midway through twenty-five. How how are we saved? How 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 do we come to be saved? Through, through the blood of Jesus Christ. Blood of Jesus Christ. Okay, but what happens inside of us? I'm looking for that specific word. Faith. We are, we are atoned. We are atoned. We, well, we have faith. Just like Abraham had faith, what Abraham believed God and was accredited him, to him as righteousness, and he had faith in God. And every other time that um, we see somebody that's, that's chosen in, the, in the, the, the Old Testament, they had faith, what they had faith in. It wasn't in the law, but it was in the, what the law pointed to, which was the future perfect sacrifice. Now that's from commentary. <laughs> but uh, I have heard that before, where those who, previous saints, uh, Old Testament saints were saved because God said, I'm going to provide you a sacrifice. I'm going to provide your perfection. Um, Abraham and Isaac, right? Um, the big issue with with Abraham and Isaac when he was told go sacrifice your son, and he went through with it, and God held him back, but it was credited to him, and it was shown that God provided that sacrifice. God, he had faith that God would provide that sacrifice, um, at the very least that he would resurrect um, Isaac if he went through with it. Uh, Abraham that, that had that much faith. So anyway, oh, some, somebody's yeah. studying uh, chapter four already. <laughs> huh? <laughs> somebody's uh, studying ahead in chapter four. Yeah, it's probably coming out, isn't it? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, it, it's. I love that. I love that conversation. So I'm looking forward to it. It is. It's a wonderful conversation. But but it's interesting that it's, it says that God withheld punishment for the people prior to Christ. He withheld their punishment. For former for, sin. And yeah, for former sins. And then there's that word just. Uh, so as to be just. Yes. And the yes. one who justifies. You know, justifying, yeah, we all say that we want justice. <laughs> we don't want justice. Justice means that we're, we'd be annihilated because we're sinful. What we want is mercy and grace. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. We do not want just in front of a holy God. No, sir. No, sir. We would be annihilated. Well, it, it, it also shows that he, he is the only one that is truly just. That's right. In his ways, that's why he's eligible to be the justifier. That's right. Only one eligible. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. I don't know why that, that reminded me of uh, Revelation 22, the, the, first, the Alpha and the Omega, and then the, uh, 
what is it, the um, the root and where am I going with uh, update? The root and the offspring. Offspring, the root yeah. and the offspring of David. Yeah, that's that's me. I don't know why I thought of that. The just and the justifier. Mm. It's a nice and out. It's just another great way to describe, you yeah. know, the uh, uh, eternity, eternity of G, of God. That's right. The Alpha and Omega. Uh, we're looking at twenty-seven and twenty-eight now. Whose turn is it? Solomon? I read that one. So whoever's after me. All right, Solomon. All right. All right. All right. 27 and 28? Yeah, 27. Oh, yeah, 27. Yeah, 27, 28. Where then is boasting? It is excluded because of what? Law? The law that requires work? No, because of the law that requires faith. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Wow. Wow. So if I have faith enough, can I not just sin all I want? The answer is no, but I know you're going to ask why. <laughs> well, if you have if you have faith and you and you abide in the word, then you won't sin. Okay. You won't desire to sin if you right. because, because the faith and the law go hand in hand. Well, certainly the law points to the need for faith. Yeah. The law, law because lets us know why we need faith. That's for sure. I don't, I don't know where you probably know uh, where this verse is, but it says um, it's about overcoming temptation. It says, uh, "With man, this is impossible, but with God, nothing is impossible." So you have to have faith to follow the law and overcome temptation and sin. Yeah, the words are the. There is no temptation that has. Uh, my memory fails me. Help me, guys. Come on, Red. I, 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 parap <laughs> I paraphrased it. I know I was probably off. No, you're right. No, you, you're, you're right. You, there's no temptation that has overcome man that is. That, 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 that. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was something that Jesus said to his disciples. Yeah, we'll have to look that up for next week. Yeah. Um, That's not from the temptation in the desert, is it? No, I think he was speaking to his disciples. I can find it real quick. Yeah, we we do have Google, don't we? <laughs> First Corinthians yeah. ten thirteen, which is that'd be, be Paul talking. <laughs> Uh, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. So, Solomon, I think you, you, you do have a different verse. The, uh, through God, you know, uh, all things are possible or nothing is impossible. I think that may be a different reference. That's a different reference, yeah. We got all things are possible. Um, well, I know Mark fourteen thirty eight says, "Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak." We lost him. <laughs> <laughs> I like. There it is. Oh, Matthew nineteen twenty six. Oh, uh, yep, that's the one. There you go. Uh, Jesus looked at them and said, "With man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible." Yeah, Absolutely. yeah. I think I think he was talking to them about like fasting and uh, casting out some demons or something like that, because the. I might be I might have it all wrong, but I, I think that they were trying to cast out a demon without Jesus being there, and Jesus said that uh, um, this type can only be cast out through prayer and fasting. 
he did that. I can't tell you the context of what he was talking about right here, but you are correct in saying that, that uh, that type of demon, whatever type of demon that was. Yeah, that um, one's really powerful to me because like, like how fast fasting can be so powerful because even like on a, on a biological level, whenever you fast, your body like literally eats itself and it gets rid of all the old parts of your cells that aren't working anymore and replaces them. It's so crazy. It is. It is. It's, it's like purifying you. Yeah. Um, and we're, we're, we're kind of chasing the rabbit right now a little bit, but actually in context, uh, Jesus was talking. Let's see where he was talking. The rich, the rich man. Tell, telling parables at the time. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the rich guy had just uh, come and talked with him and just couldn't do what Jesus told him needed to be done. And so, uh, and then he turned to his disciples and said, said, it's nearly impossible to be saved, but with God, it's, with, with God, it's possible pretty much. So, okay, right, I took it away out of context. My bad. No, no, that's good. That's, that's why we chase these things. That's good. Um, all right, we're looking at uh, 29 and 30. I'll, I'll pop that out. Or is, well, at 31. Uh, or is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too. Since there is only one God, who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through that same faith? Uh, do we then nullify the law by this faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. Um, so the big question is, how do we uphold the law? Hmm. Well, I, I think I smell smoking brain. Well, it goes back to uh, who will justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. So we uphold the law by being consecrated to God by the gospel and by being conformed to the word, uh, not through ritual or sacrifice or um, by heritage, but by faith. That's a so, stab at it. And, no, that's a good stab. It's a good stab, and you're in the right direction because so what what makes that faith so precious to us? Because we know how sinful we are because of the law. So it's a huge reminder. If we got rid of the law, we just got rid of the Old Testament. We got rid of um, uh, everything that had to do with the law and whatnot. Who's to say what sin was? You know how how. Who's to say how pure God is? Well, the law told us how pure God was and how much we couldn't get there. And so uh, in that sense, we, we uphold the law uh, because it reminds us of how far we are off the mark. Make sense? It's saying we uphold the law by faith. We uphold the law by faith. And we have faith because we know how much we missed the mark. Right. Yeah. So you can say it by saying it another way is that by constantly reminding ourselves of our need for a savior yeah. and for yeah. a God. Yep. Right. Yep. All right. Very good. So that, in a nutshell, is Romans 3, and I am so looking forward to Section 2, so looking forward to moving on into grace, fellas. Uh, first part of Romans has been a little more difficult.